Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be speaking here in Zagreb with you. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers for their perseverance. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, as you said, Maria, this, uh, this paper is a, a part of uh, my PhD research and not necessarily something I had the space to include in my PhD, but um, something I researched. Um, I'm going to speak about the work of women photojournalists in the first Gulf War of 1990-1991. So it is a historical approach. So that's the war in which uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq in August 1990 invaded their neighbor country Kuwait. And an international coalition led by the US formed to liberate Kuwait, destroying much of Iraq in the process. Um, okay. <laughs> Where do I point? <laughs> um, okay. It is a generally accepted fact uh, that the first Gulf War was experienced mainly through the medium of television and that there was not a lot of photography um, in this supposedly high-tech, new kind of war without victims, supposedly. Um, yet my PhD research showed that there were many photojournalists uh, present on the ground, in fact, and even if their work was not widely disseminated um, at the time, many photographs do exist of the conflict and the people involved in it. Um, in fact, it is my belief that the first Gulf War is a key moment to investigate established narratives of photojournalism history and bring to light new narratives. Photographers in the Gulf War were either members of the US organized media pools, um, and the, the term embedded actually came later in, uh, in, uh, because the, the media pools, then the way the US handled the press was not satisfactory in the Gulf War in the end. Um, and they were less frequently independents who tried to make their way outside of the legal framework of the pools. Either way, they were generally based in the nearby country of Saudi Arabia. Um, and all, another point to mention is that this conflict had a special significance for gender issues. Um, sorry. Um, notably, the reason for that is, uh, is because women soldiers were allowed to fight for the first time alongside men on the front lines, um, notably in the US military. So their presence sparked sustained media attention, not only to their position within the Western uh, military and the Allied forces, but also to the issues supposedly arising from their presence at the contact with local women. Um, whose status was so strikingly different from that of American women um, in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in particular. Um, so here a photo by Abbas that shows this encounter. Um, in this context, um, the idea of finding the women in the Gulf War not only means looking out for the way they are represented in photographs, um, I gave another talk about this at the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies in uh, 2019. Um, but it means also seeking out the women photographers, so what I'm talking about today. Um, unfortunately, the general tendency of unequal employment in photojournalism remained the rule in that conflict. Um, there were a, a slim minority of women photojournalists on the ground. Um, I'm showing this, um, and their work is not easily accessible today. And this is a, a, um, a snapshot from Howard Chapnick's book published in 1994 after the Gulf War. He was the retired president of the Black Star Agency, and his book included one chapter dedicated to women and minorities in the profession. I don't know, this still felt at the time like the right way to approach it, to approach this topic. Um, it's an interesting read in itself to take the measure of where things were at uh, still three years after the end of the Gulf War. My paper is devoted to addressing, if not rectifying, this bias by highlighting the work of two women photographers who documented this conflict, um, Isabel Elson and Fran Françoise de Mulder. 
because the work of women photographers is yet um, another category of forgotten images from the Gulf War. Um, and my research is dedicated to bringing these photos and these photographers back into the discussion and the collective memory. So my PhD, just to say, did not focus exclusively <coughs> on women and on feminist issues, um, but I approached these themes in several places throughout my study of misremembered images. Um, so first of all, Isabel Elson. She was born in 1958 and died in 2012 at the age of 54, very young, of a heart attack. She was a French journalist. She started at 18 years old, working for Paris Match and Elle, then became a reporter for Le Journal du Dimanche and the ra a radio station. Um, so first a, a written jour uh, journalist. Um, she later switched in 1989 to being a self-taught war photographer, um, as well as a writer and a script writer. She narrated her photographic career in a memoir entitled Je voulais voir la guerre, I wanted to see war. And this book is an interesting primary source of information on the work of women war photojournalists at the time. Um, in, during the Gulf War itself, she was an independent photographer. She was not attached to any one press photo agency. She also chose not to join the official media pools organized by the US military, um, just like a number of other journalists and photographers um, known as unilaterals. So this is examples of her work <coughs> as published so in the graphic design of the independent newspaper. Um, I explore the, the phenomenon of the unilaterals in depth in my thesis for those who may be interested in that topic. Um, she asked and described that group as resistant to authority and as, I quote, about 40 recalcitrant photographers who paraded their insolence in all the forbidden places. Um, according to her narrative, they had an impudent and irreverent character, tinted with anti-Americanism, unwilling to follow U.S. rules and rebelling against the privileges accorded to the, the U.S. Um, press contingent within the pools. Um, another author in an American photo magazine article described the group of unilaterals as photographers who knew each other from having worked on other conflicts um, uh, together to over the years and as being professionally generous towards each other but yet forming somewhat of a macho environment, um, despite the occasional presence of a woman like Elson. Being independent from the pools um, allowed Elson to associate with whomever she wanted. As a woman, she could not drive in Saudi Arabia. So she paired up with male colleagues throughout the war. It also gave her the freedom to work with her preferred medium, black and white film. Um, so there was no digital cameras in use yet during the first Gulf War. Um, she was using black and white film and the pool rules enforced the use of certain photographic techniques including color and film, not slides, which were the preferred uh, medium of photojournalism. So she was outside of those rules so she could use whatever she pleased. Um, there were many photographic skills she did not previously have or know, um, having taken up photography only in 1989, um, a couple of years earlier. So during the Gulf War, she self-taught to develop black and white film uh, in her bath hotel bathroom with the help of other photographers and press professionals. So uh, it is a bit anecdotal, but here she is. Um, uh, she can be seen developing film um, in Saudi Arabia, having received a few tips from British photographer Derek Hudson um, and practiced, supposedly, that's the narrative, uh, all night to master darkroom gestures and routines to be able to send it back to, her, to, to the UK or wherever. Um, so unilaterals may have cultivated the narrative of being free from the pools and therefore being less influenced by US war propaganda. But I argued um, that they were, there were in fact many limitations to their supposedly alternative coverage, um, despite the ongoing argument that they were acting in the name of press freedom, their images in fact did not necessarily contradict or resist Western propaganda aims. Um, 
Act additionally, being outside the pools did not always mean better quality coverage. Elson's work was published uh, notably in the British newspaper The Independent, as you can see some examples here, and it includes, uh, for instance, pictures of vehicles, in other words, hardware. So hardware was a category of images most represented at the time in Gulf War pictorial coverage in the media. Um, a little bit bigger. Um, here we can see a Humvee portrait, as I call it, um, published on 29th of January 1991 on the left. The vehicle is front-facing, central in the frame, amid the shrubby desert landscape, and seems almost staged with a soldier camouflaged by branches perched upon it. The caption is educational, um, aimed at familiarizing readers with the, this new entry into the US arsenal. I quote, a US cavalry Humvee reconnaissance vehicle, a far cry from the unit's original transport, and ideal for scouting in difficult Saudi desert, desert terrain. She's also the author of a tank portrait on the right, um, published on 15th of January 91, and it is showing, a, I quote, British Army Challenger tank negotiating a sand dune on maneuvers in the Saudi Arabian desert. So these two examples of land vehicles, I developed this topic of vehicles and both of these in my PhD. Um, so they are interesting because despite the collective memory of the war being focused on planes and high-tech weapons and smart bombs, these were also emblematic. Um, the Gulf War has been dubbed the last great tank battle, um, as tanks from the European front, having become obsolete with the end of the Cold War in, the, in 89, were shipped to the Gulf Desert and reused. Iraq was using Cold War models of Russian tanks, while the US was exploiting their own never used in battle Cold War tanks. Interestingly, so it was a bit of a rerun of the Cold War there somehow. Um, these are narratives of the Gulf War that didn't necessarily live on in the, in the wider collective memory, especially not visually. Um, so I realized that uh, that was only a small taste of Elson's work during the Gulf War, but I would now like to move on to the second photographer, um, Françoise de Mother. She was born in 1947 and died uh, in 2008 at the age of 61, also very young. Um, and I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I think it's, it, it shows something about the difficulty of their careers. Um, from complications of leukemia, a cancer which left her paraplegic for several years. Um, she is remembered as the first woman awarded a World Press Photo of the Year award in 1977 for a picture of the persecution of Palestinians by Christian phalangists during the Lebanese Civil War. There is little in-depth literature about her life and career, but she was included alongside seven others in the recent exhibition um, by the Kunstpalast Düsseldorf and Paris Museums dedicated to women war photographers. I don't know if any of you saw it. Um, her name um, has also been recently associated uh, in France, since last year actually, to a national French prize for women photojournalists, so the Dumbledore Prize. Um, the narrative about her life uh, goes something like this. She studied philosophy, um, had an early career as a model, and left for Vietnam in the early 1970s with her then photographer boyfriend, uh, learned photography on the job in Vietnam and joined the Gamma Agency. Um, she was uh, there one of a trio of French women of the same generation, um, along with Catherine Leroy and Christine Spengler, who, who were both also with Gamma in Vietnam. So, and this trio reportedly, I quote, helped crack open the male-dominated field of war photography during the Vietnam War. Um, when trying to track the uh, <coughs> Mulder's Gulf War images on the Getty Images <coughs> database, because that's where Gamma pictures ended up, um, we discovered that she was in Jordan, both at the beginning of the Gulf crisis in 1990, 
And in February 91, she was in uh, Jordan as well during the war. And Jordan was the only country alongside the Palestinian Authority to be on the side of Iraq during that war. So there in Jordan, she photographed refugees as well as civilians' demonstrations. Um, I talked about her photos of civilian protests in Jordan in another conference in called Aesthetics, Emotions, War in 2021. Um, she also worked in Iraq itself in February 91. Um, so probably as soon as the ceasefire was pronounced on the 28th of February 91. And she, she seemed uh, to have visited several major cities in that country over the course of several months afterwards, including Baghdad, Najaf, Karbala, and Basra. What makes her work particularly interesting is that all these locations were, uh, Jordan included, were outside the American coalition er coalition's area. So not only was her work produced outside the framework of the American media pools, but it also shows a point of view not from Saudi Arabia like the other ones, um, from the side of Iraq and its allies. A caveat, of course, is that it is difficult to find where her images were mainly published and how widely they have been seen, um, which is indeed a setback if you want to properly <coughs> study the impact of her work at the time. However, my endeavor is to identify and rehabilitate existing but underseen imagery of the conflict. Um, so her images, um, show us aspects of the war that are seldom represented <coughs> and addressed. They show an alternative representation of the war, um, departing from the dominant, usually remembered type of images. So we'll have a, a little closer look at her series depicting families returning to their destroyed homes in Iraq, which is um, another side of representation of women in their status as displaced people. Um, to give you some context, the US coalition bombed Iraq for several weeks during the Gulf War from the 17th of January to the 23rd of February 1991 before what is remembered as the famous 100 hour ground war that liberated Kuwait per se. Then immediately after this, after the ceasefire, when Iraqi invaders had to leave Kuwait, um, Iraq saw an uprising of the population against Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath party. So the US had <coughs> indirectly encouraged this uprising, but did nothing to help the population, who subsequently got crushed by the Iraqi state's um, cruel dictatorial machine. Um, so that's for the context. And here, Iraqi women, as seen in De Mulder's images, uh, all wear the superficially uh, homogenizing black abaya. The families represented are composed of children, teenagers, and women. The men are seldom seen as part of the family unit, um, which appears to be led in a bit of a ma matriarchal fashion. Um, they are pictured walking, returning to a landscape of devastation, uh, or settling for a picnic in what the caption informs us are the ruins of their house. Showing these scenes draws attention not only to the Iraqi uprisings that followed the war, but also to the damage caused, caused by the Allied bombing campaign, uh, which had not been reported to its full extent because the US media rep repressed represent this kind of representation of destruction. The population's socioeconomic situation can be inferred from the pictures, seeing the you know, total ruination of the environment houses and infrastructure, um, the presence of a horse-drawn carriage at the top, uh, women sitting on the ground, surrounded by folded clothes and personal effects. So Dumaldo's pictures focus on the relationship of people with their surroundings and with their family members. This is um, what is now known and conceptualized as war aftermath photography. Um, a photographic genre which frequently focuses on the grand and aestheticized character of ruins in the tradition of the sublime. But it doesn't here picture empty and desolate streets. Uh, instead, it shows industry, relieved happiness, and determination seen, uh, for example, in the family um, steadily and pur purposefully walking in the ruins of Karbala. Um, in those same weeks, 
the Western media was rather showing this, um, the dazzling images of the burning oil wells in the desert of Kuwait, and putting the blame on the Iraqis for this disaster. Um, on the contrary, uh, in Jamal's pictures, Iraqis are shown not as the battered, losing enemy, but as the victims of allied aggression, and as a strong society in the process of resuming everyday life, um, despite the dual hardship of continuing economic sanctions uh, from the international community and the Ba'ath regime, um, its cruel p punishments. The other um, location which de Mulder photographed was Jordan, one of the key geographical locations for the influx of Iraqi refugees due to its common border and support of Iraq. Um, Françoise de Mulder um, offered a nuanced depiction of refugees flowing into Jordan from Baghdad. Um, she showed expatriate refugees from, from a variety of ethnic and socio-economic backgrounds, notably <coughs> French, um, Japanese, and Filipino. Um, so here you can see their luggage, possessions, their dress, um, sometimes their cars and facial expressions belie their status as war refugees. Um, somewhat uh, surprisingly, some of these pictures resemble the depiction of tourist groups. <laughs> All the more so when the product protagonists are located in an airport or in an urban setting. It is migration as a hybrid experience um, between hardship and adventure, exile and tourism, uh, depending on your, your um, socio-economic background, obviously. These photographs also suggest that uh, Baghdad where these groups came from was actually, uh, or, or other cities actually in Iraq, um, was actually a cosmopolitan city inhabited by a range of international expatriates. A notion that the Western media um, war propaganda did not particularly showcase. Um, in the, instead, you know, being busy constructing Iraq as undiscerningly backwards and brutal. Um, one, uh, I mean, other of her images do in fact depict. Um, you know, the sadly more familiar tropes of destitute refugees and sprawling camps in the desert. So I just wanted to also show these to not have this false idea. Um, showing the traumatic impact of the war on civilian populations. Um, and this was underlined by many commentators, but um, overlooked uh, in the Western media's representation of the war. So I'm just going to now say a few words in conclusion. Um, so in my research, adopting a feminist and as well as a post-colonial methodology has indeed led me to discovering different types of imagery um, that were, I'm just going to put both photographers there, um, that were resistant to the dominant discourse, but that had been rarely seen in the mainstream media. Photographs of refugees, displaced people, Iraqi victims, civilian life, and others. Um, but it isn't the work of women photojournalists alone that led to this, um, and that showed this side of the war. Um, you know, the common belief that women war photographers, as something that was said in Howard Chapnick's book at the time, for example, that they, thanks to their supposedly feminine traits, such as empathy, uh, that they show a different version of the war than men, that is obviously a dated one, as we all know. Um, in the case of the two photographers that I is examined here, each had their own background, their different ways of entry to the profession, different technical abilities as well, and they both showed very different aspects of the war. One of them, Elsen, refused to bend to pool rules and choose to, chose to be independent, yet unwittingly she contributed to a dominant vision of the war, one showing hardware, allied combatants, and victorious imagery. Um, she avowedly, that's what she says in her memoir, was at a point in her career in which she still sought out combat, front lines, uh, soldier bravery, etc. The other photographer, de Mulder, managed to approach the war through the other side, Jordan, Iraq, and showed victims, uh, displaced people, civilians. She did not particularly seek that front line dimension of the war, uh, but rather its human consequences. So, um, yeah, if anything, I hope this presentation showcased uh, the work of two professionals uh, that many of you may not have known before because they're not part of the canon of photojournalism uh, history. And I want to, to continue showing that not only was there photographs in the Gulf War, but there was also photography of women and by women 
And all these together contribute to questioning the dominant collective memory we hold of that conflict.